Good evening. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's uh, National Arts Club at Home program. Uh, my name is Chin Dow Glasgow. I am an architect. Uh, I am on the architectural committee of the National Arts Club. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization in New York City with the mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. On behalf of the Architectural Committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's event about the Mangay Museum in San Diego, California. Uh, following discussion will be a brief Q&A, so please feel free to use the Q&A function for any questions you might have. Also, I'll reiter reiterate this at the end, um, programs will resume live uh, in September, and our next program will be September 23rd, uh, um, Posh Portals about the um, distinct um, doorways and their surrounds in New York City and about their creation. All right, and I'm going to give you a bit of background on uh, Jennifer Luce, I'm oh, sorry, Luce, Jennifer Luce. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jennifer is a fine person uh, we met only recently. Um, she is the principal and founder at Luce Architects in San Diego, California, Luce at, at Studio. Luce grew up in Canada and received her bachelor's degree in architecture at Carleton University. At Harvard University Graduate School of Design, she received her Master of Design Studies degree. Um, and without further ado, I, I give you Jennifer Luce. Thanks for inviting me. It's uh, really a thrill to share this project with everyone in the notion of museum as civic space. Uh, we are four weeks away from opening after a three-year renovation. And it's, it's really the perfect time to really culminate all the thoughts and share them with you. So thanks so much for having us. Uh, I have Christine Kim with me from our studio. She's uh, dialing in from Toronto and will help um, to uh, further the presentation with me. And um, I, think, I think what I'd like to stage just at the beginning is that this museum uh, really is a wonderful, humble, authentic institution striving to share uh, notions of Menge, which I'll talk about a little bit, um, with it, the public, with our community. And this project really, um, hopefully, is an effort to blur the boundaries between uh, what we understand to be museum spaces and public life. So hopefully there's a, a notion of opening up and reaching outward and uh, we're just thrilled to be at a moment where we're about to do that. So uh, it's an honor to share this story with you for really the first time. So thanks so much for having us. Okay, Christine, let's, let's do it. So museum as civic space, um, a museum that reaches out, a museum that invites in, uh, a, a museum that really has no boundaries um, and, and sits within a really amazing context of a historic park, a historic urban park in the middle of San Diego. Um, so here comes the story, but this is the rendering of the south facade of the historic building. Um, with a new insertion <clears throat> of a theater building and courtyard and amphitheater. And this really is the culmination, I think, of, of, of the intent of the project is to share, to reach out and to um, engage with community in a really um, dynamic way. So just to give you a little bit of context, <clears throat> Balboa Park is um, a historic park, 173 years old now. 
Um, it's the largest recreational urban park in the United States. Um, Olmsted, Frederick Law Olmsted had a hand in its initial um, planning and it evolved over many, many years, uh, especially in 1915 to host the Panama um, California Exposition, the World Exposition, which was really quite remarkable. Um, the center of the park uh, consists of particularly Plaza de Panama, which is the central space you see, and then the yellow at the bottom left of that plaza space is Mingay International Museum's home. As architects, <clears throat> we began this project uh, with a fairly modest brief. And in lots of conversation with director Rob Seidner and his amazing management group, um, and uh, an incredibly cur uh, courageous and curious board, we began to explore an expansion of the idea of and the intent of the project. And for us, looking inward, looking outward, there are so many ways to really dive into a project and understand it. And we listen deeply. And through listening, we found so much opportunity together as a group. Um, but it really begins with the research of Minge itself. It's a term that maybe not that many people know, but um, Christine, if you could go back one slide, um, founded and, and really initiated by Suetsu Yanagi, the second person from the right, who began to write about um, industrialization and how it had maybe threatened traditional craft and especially things made um, for use, for functional use by own unknown craftsmen. And so he was really, really projecting in some ways to the future of, of this struggle between industrialization, the machine, uh, the notions of digital technology now and how we um, make sense of that with this beautiful handcraft. And on the right uh, of Soetsu is uh, Martha Longenecker, who was a San Diego resident and really founded um, Menge Museum um, through her personal studies with Yanagi and, and bringing notions and, and, and the philosophy of Menge to our amazing city. And we're just so thrilled to have Menge International Museum here there is a smaller Minge Museum in Tokyo um, really celebrating Yanagi's work. And so this is an offshoot of that, but has its own wonderful identity. And we, we really look forward to sharing it with all of you. The collection um, is vast and international, 165 countries, uh, objects of craft, um, design, and folk art. Uh, it's really, in some ways, the history of the world, the history of people. It is art of the people, art for the people. This is truly the purpose and mission of this amazing museum. And there's no, in my mind, there's really no better way to make uh, the projection to civicness of this museum because it really is all of our histories together. So we expanded the project from a very small renovation of, uh, let's literally say the flooring in the museum and the lighting and some storage elements that were need for function uh, to really having a dialogue with Rob and his group about the opportunities this amazing place has to share with everyone. So, ideas about organization, about civicness, about the true mission, about creating a narrative and a story to tell our community and to make sensory spaces that one can feel. And so a very complicated series of thoughts, but we began to map them out into this mind map of all the opportunities connected to each of these strategic themes and how they could expand outward to community, to the world. And this was the beginning of a really wonderful conversation. 
So then we did some exploration, some study, some research, and a lot of travel to see how other museum typologies were shifting, changing, and they truly are evolving as the 21st century uh, advances. And some of these typologies um, that we had particularly explored were things like connecting to the urban context, which in our case, Balboa Park was so important, engaging with exterior public spaces, creating civic openness with simple gestures like natural light, um, making social life. It's, it's become uh, such an important element of many, many museum experiences. Uh, cross-pollination of programming so that um, there's a civic aspect to dance being intersected with poetry and making of art and craft and how we can really celebrate all of those diverse disciplines. Um, adding new program to a museum that historically is known as one thing and becomes another, revealing the collection, um, circulation throughout the space being experienced, authenticity of material and strengthening cultural presence. So all of these things become very important responsibilities of the institution, the architect and, and us as a team together, which I, I cannot emphasize enough how important that relationship is, um, how open and trusting it has become for us. And, and I really think that, that it, it speaks to the success of a project like this. So engaging with the mission of Minge to share century rich experience, to share a notion of optimism and inspiration, to celebrate function and beauty, and to always remain humble and personable. That these were just, they're just such astute aspirations. And then to connect them to each of our other studies and understand that this was a project that evolved over time I think we spent the first year and a half really studying all of these things together so that we could build a narrative that's strong for our city, where city entities and governments could support us and our donors are supporting us. And I'm so uh, optimistic of how our general public will really engage with this project. So Minge, and Balboa Park then and now, it's a historic park. I think it's important to really understand your context and um, what your opportunities are from that study. So here is um, Balboa Park in 1915 uh, during the Panama, California exposition. The building on the lower right is Minge's home at, and was then the mining building. Um, Alcazar Garden, a beautiful um, Spanish-inspired historic garden, still exists today and has been just recently restored. And then Plaza de Panama in the central area, just a very exciting space for people to enjoy in 1915 for the exposition. Here is uh, the mining building. Uh, now called the House of Charm, where Minge uh, lives with two other tenants, um, the Old Globe Theater, which does its rehearsals in the building, and the San Diego Art Institute. So it's a wonderful combination of um, use. So over about a two-year period, we took a lot of trips and traveled with um, Rob, his team, um, many of the board members at the museum who were passionately determined to transform the understanding of this museum to something very, very civic. And so these are examples of either our, our research or our travel finding, and many of them are in New York City, by the way, um, finding places that were really reaching outward. And, you know, particularly, of course, the Whitney, the Whitney was just opening when we uh, visited 
this notion of terraces and reaching out to um, your context, all the way to the bottom right where we strengthen identity and cultural presence with art, with the presence of art. And this is an image from LACMA, um, the LACMA entry courtyard, which of course is under renovation now, but we probably would never have um, initiated this sort of civic um, gesture without understanding the world around us and how things are transforming in the museum world. It's very, very exciting. So here is a very uh, simple view of the building in its context, Alcazar Garden on the left and Plaza de Panama on the right. And our first urge in dealing with a historic closed down structure was how do we elbow out and reach out to community. So uh, previously two entrances to the museum ground level and now um, multiple ways to experience the space. And, and this opening up of the facade and penetrating it so that light enters the space, light leaves the space and is shared in the arcades. And this idea of sharing with community, um, it, it was an architectural concept, but in the end it became a mission for the museum to do this in a really profound way. And so the entire ground floor of the museum um, is free and open to the public. And in some ways we coined a term and called it the living room of the park. It's the one interior space that one can just visit without paying an admission and, and really experience togetherness. And we're very, very excited about this. There are so many functions and programmatic elements on this level, a public gallery that talks about the meaning of Menge, an education wing, um, a new courtyard, exterior courtyard, which is a new landscape in the park, um, a cafe and a um, shop Menge, the beloved shop, uh, museum shop that has been um, in, in, in existence for many, many years. So there's just so many ways to be introduced in a way to a museum in this way and be introduced to Menge, which is not a, a common um, museum term. It's not a, a common way of showing art and it's just so personal and intimate and it's very, very exciting to imagine people just flowing through from west to east, east to west, and experiencing whatever they want to and exploring more as they rise up to the gallery level. So we really reduced our goals to uh, these four particular, uh, to blur the boundaries, um, to intersect program and intersect the music the museum with public life, to open the museum and become a civic living room, to add public landscapes. So to add a landscape to a historic park felt like a true gift from the museum to the city and to reclaim lost spaces and bring together community in a curious and exciting way. And I'll talk about this aspect in a little bit. Um, it's very exciting to explore a historic structure and find spaces that people haven't used for years and years. So aspiration number one to blur boundaries. So this is the collaborative level, i.e. the lower level of, of the building. Um, and there was one space in the bottom right that's colored. Um, that was a loading dock and it was quite non-functional and um, dark and not used and not historic. And through working with the historic resources um, and understanding the rules of the National Register of Historic Places, we were able to propose a new building here. And it's a theater, it's a black box theater, um, a multi-purpose theater, and it is the place where the boundaries of the park and the museum are blurred. The boundaries of museum function and program um, are 
you know, blown apart and there can be so many ways to share um, the arts with community in the space. And it will be shared not only with Menge, but with their partner institutions in a very, very generous, generous way. So this is a section showing you how we inserted the um, theater into that lower loading dock space. And on the roof emerges a courtyard um, for the public and a very, very exciting sectional relationship and an outdoor amphitheater on the right in a beautiful setting. Palm Canyon is just one of the most beautiful parts of the park. And this is our view from the theater. So here's a rendering of the theater and this notion of reaching out the simplest gesture of making a very large glass wall that opens up uh, depending on, on the climate and the need um, to really bring the museum programming to the outdoors and bring the outdoors into the museum. We're very excited. This space is almost done and there's some additions to it that I'll talk about in a little bit that are really exciting. So here's the, the image of the theater with the doors open and an amphitheater um, seating situation on the outside, our wonder, lined by our wonderful jacaranda trees that are very common here in San Diego and beautiful, colorful, and just vibrant. And then the courtyard atop where one can look down on the activity. And a view from from the sidewalk, from the street, uh, lining the museum um, edge and a beautiful setup for uh, a piano concert. So many different things. And we already have some wonderful programming planned for opening weekend. Um, Labor Day weekend is our, our opening officially. Even the construction of each of the parts of the building in some ways becomes a celebration of craft. And we have documented all of this and it will be shared with our community that the museum has such a dedication to craft that uh, very, very particular ways of building. And this was just an exciting moment for us to understand what it takes to pour a concrete volume and how complicated that is and what an artful execution it is. So within our study of that 1915 situation, we found this photograph. And the photograph shows people up on the terraces. And this became the precedent for us to discuss with the historic staff and the National Register about how could we reoccupy these spaces. They hadn't been even experienced in decades and decades. So um, it's through the sort of diving in and really researching that we find these ways to connect the civic uh, identity of the building back to its people. So uh, this will be this is one of the reclaimed spaces where we're creating these wonderful terraces that allow you a completely different perspective of the park itself. So here is the upper gallery level where the terraces um, are located. There's a south terrace that's small and a north terrace that is sort of an L shape. And we have just really simply um, made them wooden decks, beautiful uh, glass rails, and just a completely different experience of the park itself. And we'll be filling those with events and daily lemonade um, cart runs, um, people relaxing and people taking a pause. So a pause from experiencing art to experiencing the civic aspect of a city. Um, th this to us was so well described at the Whitney um, and really, really stuck with us for, um, for so many years. And, now it's come to fruition for Menge. And then aspiration number three, reclaiming lost spaces. We, there, was a bell, there was a bell tower 
in the building, but it had never been occupied as anything but a stair going to the basement. So we um, requisitioned it as our grand staircase from the main level up to the gallery, but also a place to house a very, very important piece of art um, in the collection. And um, this is a Dale Chihuly piece um, that is really quite spectacular, very subtle, very beautiful. But in essence, we reclaimed the bell tower as an activity spot, as a place to really enjoy a work of art. And it's a circulation space that's very, very exciting. So here on the right, you can see it being restored. And on the left are rendering how, of how the Chihuly, Chihuly um, fits into the context. So to house a work of art, to be the vessel to contain a work of art, as something that is really quite uh, revered in our community, um, we began to do studies of how that bell tower could remain its historic self on the outside, but then have a completely new, not new life on the interior. So we started modeling the, the scale of the tower itself, um, 3D printing the experience to understand it as it's sculpted. And here is Rob <laughs> for the very first moment, seeing the space fully accessible uh, in its four to five stories tall. Um, and this is exactly where this beautiful wooden stair will be, um, will be built. Um, only yesterday, uh, the Chihuly was completed and hung in the space with this wonderful um, skylight at the top and a series of really intricate lighting strategies developed by HLB Lighting and the Dale Chihuly um, installation crew. So we're working very, very closely with everyone to make sure that this piece has a wonderful home for its, for its future. And then um, aspiration number four, adding public landscape to a historic park. So understanding that the courtyard on um, the roof of the theater had an opportunity to be a new public space. Balboa Park is expansive, its landscape is huge, and there are very few intimate spaces um, to really just gather. And so we feel really, really excited to share this new intimate space. Um, it's about 2000 square feet and it, um, it is lined on uh, all four sides and it creates a wonderful intimate um, place to be. And it's also an exterior place to make a statement about the mission of the museum. And on the left, you see uh, a beautiful mural that is copper enamel um, done by a couple here who worked in San Diego in the 1950s. Their name is Wooly. Um, it's a beautiful piece. It's being restored and, and mounted shortly. Um, but it, 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 all of a sudden, this new space allows us the opportunity to share a work of this grand scale. And then to the right, I'll talk about this a, a little bit in a few minutes, this notion of um, a requirement by the city to create a fence and why not make a fence that is art worthy. And so we'll talk about that in a sec. And here's an evening view of movie night. We imagine so many wonderful outdoor things happening in this space. So, Architecture in my mind is, is, especially for a museum, is a vessel. It's a beautiful neutral vessel that allows um, the exhibition of fine artworks and yet also experience, um, the experience of something remarkable. And in keeping with the mission of this museum about craft and design, we decided um, with the museum to commission a series of artists to inject their work into the architecture. So it, it's not separate, it's not works mounted on the wall. 
these are works that are intrinsic to the architectural understanding and experience of the museum itself. And so they become functional, which is so important to the Menge philosophy, but also beautiful moments of curiosity. And we are just really, really um, excited. This next week is when we mount all these pieces and they become a part of the architecture. And we're very excited to share this part with you. Um, two of the works we actually took on ourselves and the fence that I previously mentioned is one of them. Um, we collaborate so often with really special craftspeople. And in this case, we decided to um, collaborate with A. Zaner from Kansas City, the oldest um, metalworking shop in the United States, uh, who are now digitally incredibly savvy. So we took on a project of, of asking them how we could make something that is not only digitally produced, but hand hewn as well. And so together um, this design emerged, um, some of the inspiration that runs through our heads as architects, um, the traditional Japanese candles, um, the work of Beverly Pepper, um, the work of Peter Alexander here in California, and this notion of wrapping, the wrapping of the courtyard space with this fence. So here we are in Zaner's shop in Kansas City. Um, we've done so many projects with them. It's really taking metal to the level of art. And in this case, um, these beautifully hand twisted brass pickets, each one individually hand hewn um, to create a, a very, very special effect. So here's the courtyard again and the line on the right is the line of the fence. Here were some of the studies, the three-dimensional studies and understanding of how we would fabricate and make because making is such an important part of the mission of the museum. And as you experience the fence today, you really have a true understanding that there was a lot of love and passion put into this. And you see the digital cutting of each picket and then the hand finishing um, and the hand twisting of each picket, really an amazing process. And in some ways, a, a civic um, gesture towards our city that making, the making of art is important to our culture. So then a second piece, is a canopy that sits inside the plaza level um, that gathers you under, uh, under itself to describe the shop Minge and the new restaurant and to give an intimate sense of this. I can't honestly recall the location of this historic image. It, it, it's definitely something in New York City, <laughs> but it was really an inspiration for us to develop this canopy again with A. Zaner in um, Kansas City. And on the right is the beginnings of our sketch of the canopy, which is a reference to music and music as craft in the mission of Minge is so important. So here's the area where the canopy sits over the cafe and the shop and really is the introduction to the museum, a very curious thing. Um, Sheet music turned into an exploration of the player piano role. And uh, that is Rob, director of the museum on the left, who's showing me his collection <laughs> of piano rolls. And we literally transcribed his favorite song onto the canopy. And one might never know that to visit, but there is a sense that there's something musical and rhythmic about it. And it's, the song is called, What Are You Doing the Rest of Your Life? Which seems quite apropos. So here's the ceiling uh, in the recently completed space. And it really acts as a one wonderful gathering um, element for the living room. That's public living room for the park. 
the, the next artist that we commissioned is Petra Blaze. She's um, an artist who lives in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam and Rotterdam. Um, she makes the most astounding curtains. And we commissioned her to make a functional curtain for the theater. And she visited San Diego and was truly taken by the Jacaranda tree, but also by Kate Sessions, who was uh, a really courageous woman at the time of building Balboa Park. And she planted most of the park herself. She's a horticulturalist, an activist. And Petra was really moved by her the power of her work and decided to dedicate this piece to this amazing woman who helped to build our city. So back to the theater, um, it's a curtain that pro provides acoustics, um, it provides drama, it provides a shading device for the windows. So there's an intense functional aspect to it that, that drives you right back to the mission of Minge, but it's also a, a thing of great craft and beauty. So here are her initial studies of translating the jacaranda leaf to a pattern, a pattern that could become a, a curtain. And in this case, uh, a 40 foot long curtain that um, is digitally uh, cut and hand sewn. So once again, there's this relationship between the hand and the digital, taking our conversation about Minge to the world, to our world of transformation that we experience today. Um, and here are some mock-ups. Mock-ups are just such an important part of the process of building. And these mock-ups are in Amsterdam, um, looking at how light and shade would come in uh, through the curtain and the voile on the left that will sit behind it as an added layer. This is going to be just an amazing, amazing work um, to celebrate. And here is um, the curtain in situ in front of the window and what an extra dynamic layer uh, a functional layer this, this piece will bring to the theater itself. And here it is from the outside. And then another um, artist from the Netherlands, Claudia Jongstra, uh, an amazing felt artist, an activist, uh, a sustainability uh, proponent, a woman who is absolutely dedicated to her community. Um, we're, we respect her work so much and we've worked with her for many years. Um, she has a farm with Drenth Heath sheep, these beautiful sheep you see on the right. They're quite rare. Um, she shares them. She creates the dyes for these um, textile pieces from her garden. She is, um, I think, the epitome of a maker, of, of someone crafting something truly authentic and natural. So we commissioned Cloudy uh, to make a, a wall piece um, for the main floor, knowing that that main floor was going to be very active. The living room is a, an active spot with a lot of noise. And, and so we wanted something exceptionally beautiful and connected to the mission of the museum, but also something acoustic that could um, absorb some of that sound. And so the piece has such a wonderful role to play in the living room. And so Cloudy came to the museum and proposed to Rob and his group um, a wonderful study of uh, Burgundian black, which is uh, a color found in Dutch paintings of the 18th century. She is truly studying this for her culture, for her country. And then, but listening, having her listen to Rob talk about Minge, the notions of indigo, and the importance of indigo culturally 
um, came to light. And so it's a combination of both colorations and explorations. And this little collaboration has expanded to the point where Cloudy and the museum will be doing a major uh, exhibition in 2024 around um, the history of indigo um, for Pacific Standard Time uh, sponsored by the Getty. So we love how these collaborations expand themselves outward to a uh, community. And here is the piece being produced in the Netherlands. And you can see how it starts with these very simple uh, strands of wool and it slowly but surely becomes this beautiful 35 foot long um, textile wall piece. I wouldn't call it a tapestry. I, I can't call it a mural. It's just something so, so unique. And here's Cloudy working on the piece. And here's the piece in situ over the bar. We're very, very excited about this. And then more locally, we're exploring um, a couple of pieces with Christina Kim, who was formerly um, the founder of Dosa, a wonderful um, fashion line, for she, which she uh, headed up for over 30 years. And Christina is slowly but surely transitioning to um, these kinds of interventions and installations at museums and on the left you see her uh, the day I met her at the Cooper Hewitt where she had a wonderful show about reuse of material and scraps um, and it really inspired us to ask her to work with us at Minge. So one of the first projects that we've done is uh, her process, a uh, very traditional Mexican process called papel picado where you cut into beautiful paper. And in this case, she's using Japanese papers um, to line two windows in a beautiful room uh, filled with George Nakashima furniture. Uh, it is the boardroom, but it is a gallery, a gallery for everyone to enjoy um, the most amazing works from the Nakashima studio over many, many decades of time. Um, and you can see in this rendering, one of the long narrow windows. So uh, Christina went to Mira Nakashima, George's daughter, and they accessed two of his drawings from uh, the, um, the archive. And we gained the rights for her to be able to abstract them into the Papa Picado. These were just recently installed and um, the way they diffuse light, the way this, artwork can functionally work in a room to diffuse light is just, just really, really remarkable. So here's one of the round windows right before the installation. And you can see her process of cutting and shaping and deciding what pattern would be best for the windows themselves. Here are the drawings, uh, the Papa Picado drawings. This one is of a walnut tree. Um, and the other one was um, a cedar of Lebanon, which is such a gorgeous, gorgeous image. Christina is also in the process of making some beautiful uh, gallery curtains. So we're all familiar with this idea that often during your visit to a museum, you might be observing an exhibition being dismantled or, or put together. And uh, there's, there's a desire to be curious, the boyer, but there's also a desire for a little bit of privacy for the nuts and bolts of the work. And so she's making these remarkable curtains that give you sort of a translucent view of what's happening behind them. Here's an image of the galleries on the upper level uh, where these curtains will live and be moved around and be very functional in terms of their use. So art, art on the move, really. Here are some first sketches of explorations of the Korean um, tradition of patchwork quilting fabric and how that could be a part of this curtain. So there's a very deep connection with each of the artists to the traditions in the collection of Mingay. On the right, one of 
Christina's uh, works in her studio in Los Angeles. And then on the left, uh, a snippet of the curtain. So here, I mean, even Christina is taking on a contemporary craft in the sense of exploring not just traditional textiles, but something called Dyneema, which is uh, a fabric used to make um, camping tents. And so using a very technological material in a traditional way, there's a dialogue going there that everyone will be able to enjoy and be curious about. And then uh, Sharon Stamfer is a former member of our studio as an architect and now uh, a jewelry artist. And we commissioned her to make a beautiful sensual handle for the door in the Nakashima room, the door in that boardroom, which is also made of walnut. And uh, Sharon in her ever so creative way mapped out the distance and you can see the map of the United States on, on the door. Um, New Hope, Pennsylvania, where Nakashima studio is all the way to Mingay in San Diego. And so the handle has been cast out of bronze represents the trip, represents the topographic map. And just at that perfect moment where you're to grab the handle is where the, the mountains, the Rockies are. And so you really have a sense of, of grabbing it. We wanted a level of detail for everyone to intimately experience. And, and this bar, this handle, I'm not even sure what to call it because it's so much more than that. Uh, will be a, a wonderful thing to touch and feel. And so we've commissioned pieces at the level of touch. And we really think that this is an important understanding of our culture, space, museums, and the act of making. And here's Sharon working away. It's so fun to see an architect using her hands. I love it. <laughs> And then last but certainly not least, uh, my two wonderful mentors and colleagues and friends, Todd Williams and Billy Sien. Uh, we recently commissioned them to make the Mingay gallery benches and there are going to be three of them and they're going to be beautiful and spectacular as always with their work. Um, but there's, there's an intimacy to their work together and to the way they think about materials and space that really made us curious about how they would approach this. And of course, Todd and Billy uh, surprised us with the most authentic and real or an organic way of looking at the world. So uh, both of them felt strongly that there ought to be a very, very simple aesthetic to the bench. And this one in the shop as a mock-up is, is very indicative of that. But that one could have one curious element to the bench, which actually is functional. It is a handle to push you up and pull you down, but very organic and beautiful and referencing uh, root benches and stools from many, many cultures and from objects in the museum's collection as well. So in the shop of their wonderful uh, craftsmen, um, there has been a root of a tree hanging for 25 years. Uh, Stephen Eno in uh, New Jersey uh, offered this root to Billy to begin to carve and use as the handle for the bench pull you up to give you a sense of movement and comfort and safety. And so they have been working together for the past two and a half months to, um, to really um, craft and sculpt these pieces. Two of them will be wood and will remain the wood of the root. The third one uh, will be cast in bronze, um, just as a, a different sensibility about material. And here are some of the studies. I mean, they're just absolutely surprising and wonderful and lyrical. And the narrative is just so beautiful. So 
I think that civic gesture of giving our community a sense of respect and curiosity about design and about craft and about making and how that expands from the outside of the building to the inside of the building, to the intimate detail of the handle on a door. Um, to us, it, it has resulted in a project that is both accessible and democratic. It's produced by handcraft and machine craft from authentic materials. These are all objects in the collection and now in the building itself of function and daily use. Um, they're representative of many regions and many traditions of making. And the entire project is deeply rooted in the practice of cultural craft. And um, this speaks so strongly to the mission of Minge and a mission that we want to allow the museum to reach out and share not only with San Diego, Southern California, the United States, but hopefully the world um, in a sense that we have 165 countries represented. And with all of these commissions, um, works from all over the world that are new, uh, we're just so, so excited um, to open the door and allow everyone a touch and feel. So once again, here are all the artists, um, happen to be women, I believe strongly in our gender. Um, I have worked for 35 years in a practice that, you know, in a profession that uh, still is only 17% female. And this idea of supporting women artists is very, very important to me. And of course we invited Todd into that <laughs> mix as well. Uh, he's so wonderful. But this is a very, very strong, um, leadership of making. And here, uh, speaking of leadership, is our group during construction, everybody on our team, Minge's team, the construction team, and even there are many of our donors in this photograph are in it together. Uh, we've really built the narrative together and it's a narrative of community really it's 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 so much more than a museum gallery it is all about community so we really really thank you for joining us in this conversation and if you have any questions we're opening in september the museum is 43 years old the park is 153 and our city is 173. So we're just, uh, wait, I love the number three. So there we have it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, that was amazing. Uh, I think you have, um, you know, at the Arts Club, um, our mission, you know, is to foster interest and promote the arts. Um, and at the Architecture Committee, you know, we focus on architect, um, architectural things, but, you know, it's, um, I think the, one of the really great things about this program was the intersection of art and architecture. Mm -hmm. It certainly happens at a museum. Um, mm -hmm. And you've shown, you know, you've seen, you, occasionally you see a lot of museums where there's really, um, you know, not as much, the architecture is not as much art as the art itself. It's more mm -hmm. just a blank canvas. Um, so really appreciate this. I'm gonna go ahead and start the Q and A. Um, Great. If, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, all right, so um, actually it was really a comment um, from uh, first person here, they, they say that in the four person slide, uh, that is not Martha Longnecker, uh, it's Marguerite Wildenhain. Oh, Potter. okay. Yeah, and- uh, our, this... our mistake. Well, we affectionately refer to Martha anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, and they say that the picture was probably taken at Black Mountain College in 1952. Mm. So. That, that's wonderful to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. fantastic. Great. Uh, the next uh, question, uh, they 
admire your presentation. They said they're getting a great sense of the museum as community center. And they're curious to know how a mu museum reconciles with what it has been seen as historically as an archive gallery of art objects, mm -hmm. uh, some of which have been taken from first voice people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, I think Minge has throughout its history um, celebrated the cultures of the works that it displays. Um, much of the, of the exhibition is people crafting and making during the exhibition itself. And I think that uh, the idea here is less to uh, display works of whatever culture might be referenced, but to really understand how the making connects to the cultural history to um, the building of their communities and the sustenance of their communities as well. So this idea of, of carrying on traditions as opposed to simply displaying them as history. And so I think this is the really uh, responsible and generous effort that Minge is making to not simply archive, but to allow things to live on real time. Wonderful. Yeah, I think that's um, a really nice aspect of, of the project. Yeah. All right. Uh, the, the next one is really just a question about the material. Uh, they're mm -hmm. asking about the copper mural in the outdoor movie space. Will it mm -hmm. age and gain a patina like the San Francisco de Young? Mm. Uh, the, the, the piece has been outdoors since the 1960s, I think. Uh, it is being restored now, but it, it does develop a wonderful patina, um, but the color remains strong. Um, it really is uh, an outdoor piece and um, I think will be cared for very carefully in this courtyard because it's slightly closer to you uh, as to the human touch. Um, but yeah, I think that natural patina uh, is an expression of authenticity too. Right, yeah, it, it's quite beautiful. Um, next question is from Emma DeRosa. She's asking, uh, what are the pickets made of? Wood or metal? Ah, they are made of three quarter inch solid brass and uh, digitally cut, hand twisted and then hand uh, patina. So the one side is the natural brass that's protected and the other side is a dark patina. So as the piece twists, the color changes too. And uh, we're just, you know, it's very, very amazing to, you know, collaborate with particularly a Zayner here who understand the component of metal, um, the origins of metal in a, in a really profound way and allowing us to play with it. Um, freely, as if it's paper, really. It's quite quite fun. Yeah, it has a, a sense of being very strong, but also lovingly made. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, next question is a bit of a technical question. Um, it is, uh, which programs or combination of programs uh, does your practice use? to create the renderings and plants. They're beautiful. Mm. Um, and mm. I think we talked about this before <laughs> and you, right. you, you see it uh, in your presentation a bit, but you do quite a bit of um, digital modeling in order to really get a sense of what the end yeah. is. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, I, I have to say I'm a bit of a dinosaur because I was trained to draw by hand and I still do. And I love that we have a dialogue in the office around that. So I do a lot of sketching and then there's a whole team doing digital um, execution, technical drawings and renderings. And so if I'm going to be correct, the, the renderings initially are made in Rhino and then uh, inserted into, um, oh my gosh, a uh, couple of other, programs that allow us to to create color and texture. 
but they're never meant to be actual renditions of a space. They're meant to express uh, more of a feeling of a space. And so they might not be ultra realistic. They're more um, the expressive way that we draw by hand. So Photoshop is one of the other programs that we use. Okay. All right. Um, next question. Oh, I think this is a bit of a, a contest uh, being made here. Um, <laughs> someone says that you said Balboa Park is the lar largest recreational urban park in the U.S. However, Fairmount Park in Philadelphia, a recreational mm -hmm. urban park, is 9,200 acres. Okay. Uh, which, is, which they believe Balboa is 1,200 acres. Can you uh. speak to this? Well, Balboa Park is a little bit misunderstood in the sense that there is the, the historic part that we, we visit as guests, but there's a whole other um, side of the park that is uh, a recreational golf course, there's tennis courts, and there, it's a very, very functional uh, recreational area. So I would have to do a little bit of calculating there, but I think that... that uh, this has definitely, um, you know, been expressed historically and archivally. But I'm happy to, I'm happy to discuss that with someone. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> we'll have to, you might have Let's to say it's a spectacular tradition. urban recreational no. park for sure. <laughs> okay. okay, great. <clears throat> oh, I like this question a lot. Um, okay, this kind good. Of gets to to the the real heart of your um, design. So the, it says these changes deal with the public aspects and ideas of making. Um, mm -hmm. Did any of the work affect the collection of objects, which is the heart of a museum? Mm -hmm. I think that um, this entire, we're calling it a transformation because it's a transformation of space. It's a transformation of ways of thinking of ways of collecting. I think that it is going to be the next iteration of the way the museum collects. It will add to the wonderful depth that the collection has now. But yes, it, it, it has, I'm not saying that it's affected it yet, but, but this is an evolution. And we're only presenting the beginning of that evolution by making a building. We are, are very excited about how this evolves in terms of programming and collecting. And we know that it will, it will not change, but it, there will be an extra layer of it that will be about this level of making. Great. And so thank you for the question because I think architecture can just be the conduit and then right. we have to, give it up and let it become what it becomes. And, and it's often surprising. Sure. Yeah. I think that, I think that um, we don't know for sure, um, let's say, but I think that you're, you will have more influence perhaps than you think um, on the museum um, by the way that you design the spaces. I secretly want to work there. <laughs> <laughs> right all right this next one is good too i think this is kind of getting to the heart of design as well um she uh, margaret margo lynn said that she likes seeing all the different media used by the six artists uh, was that deliberate in terms of the theme to show a broad scope mm -hmm. yes well at the very beginning of this project, we absolutely had no idea where it was going. I mean, it grew over time and it grew over long conversations. But I always had a list on the edge of my desk of all of the makers, the craft people that I admired. And Rob and I had discussions about each of them and we actually visited some of them. Um, but there was this desire for the diversity of making to be an expression, to allow people this uh, surprise about how things are made, what they're made of, and what their purpose is. So yeah, that diversity is definitely there, and um, it, it, it's wide range. It's a wide range of materiality, uh, texture, and it ought to be that 
um, so that every space you visit, you have another encounter with something completely different than the last one. Yeah, it's it's a it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, what is next question is what is a time period, um, which centuries, for example, that the crafts from the 165 countries uh, represent? Mm. I wish Rob was on with me because I, I need the museum to help me with that. But th there's a wonderful uh, uh, section of their website which allows you to explore the connect the collection. But uh, I'm going to say some of the older pieces might be two to 300 years old, maybe even older. Some of the older Chinese pieces might be of a different, a different uh, era completely. But um, there's a lot of contemporary work as well, uh, contemporary makers. So it's, it's uh, boy, going to the collection room is, is quite an adventure. It was yeah. previously organized by region, and I'm not sure how they're going to choose to organize it this time, but um, it was fun because we used to go in and Rob would say, well, what country would you like to visit today? <laughs> what aspect? And, and we, would, we would go on these adventures together. So, yeah, uh, from very old to very new. Sounds great. Uh, I have a few more questions, but unfortunately, we are over time. Okay. And I'd like to end off by thanking you again very much for your work and your presentation. And I hope to see the museum soon. Yes, please come and visit. <laughs> Give us about four weeks and then get on a plane. Right. <laughs> and I hope to see you soon. I did want to mention that our um, fall programs, uh, again, in September, one will be um, on Posh Portals, a book um, coming out about um, historic artistic um, entryways in New York City. And in October, we will have a special program on Little Island, um, mm, which was just built great. in the Hudson, which I went to a few days ago and is a phenomenal feat of architecture and engineering and I would say landscape design. As well. And space. civic space, like, wow. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Great. So, with that, well, I thank think you. Everyone, thank you. All right. Good night, everyone. All right. Good night from California. <laughs> Good night from New York. All right. Bye bye. Bye, bye everyone. Thank you. <laughs>